Hello everyone. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video, we will be talking about image data preprocessing. First of all, I'll just give a quick overview, which we have done in the last two videos. So, in the first video, we downloaded the images using the OIDv4 toolkit from the Google Images dataset and uploaded the images to RoboFlow. You can see those images here, and if you want to add more images to your dataset, you can do it from here. Then, in the second video, we used RoboFlow to annotate those images and divided the entire dataset into three parts, 70% of the training dataset, 20% of the validation dataset, and 10% of the testing dataset. And if we want to rebalance the data, we can do it by clicking the rebalance button. Here we will be able to change the data. We can always change it to suit our needs. So that's all we have done in the previous two videos. In this video, we will learn how to do image data preprocessing. Data preprocessing is nothing but the set of steps and operations performed on a dataset to make it optimal for training. As it is mentioned here, we need to decrease the training time and increase the performance by applying image transformations to all the images in the dataset. To apply the transformation, we have to add each transformation here. So we will click on Add Preprocessing Step. Here you can see the various types of transformations from which we can choose. So we will see each one of these transformations one by one. Now, the first thing that we will apply is Auto Orient, which strips images of the EXIF data so that we can see images displayed in the same way that they are stored on the disk. But if the data determines the orientation of a given image application, we use this data to display an image in a specific orientation, even if the orientation stored on the disk differs. RoboFlow recommends defaulting to leaving this on and checking on how our images are being fed to your model. If we want to learn more about whether or not we should use Auto Orient for our images, we can check out this blog. The next preprocessing step that we will apply is the static crop, as sometimes the model needs to predict images even when the full object is not present, like when only a small portion of the object is visible. In that case, the static crop is really helpful to train the model to predict such images. Cropping can be done both horizontally and vertically. Then we have the resize transformation. Resize changes the image size and optionally scales to a desired set of dimensions. Annotations are adjusted proportionally, except in the case of fill. Currently, this only supports downsizing. This provides some guidance for what resizing option may be best for our use case. We will be downsizing. These images provide faster trading, and if we want more information about when we should resize our images or how correctly we should resize the image, check out this blog right here. And for the next preprocessing step, it's called grayscale. This grayscale converts an image with RGB channels into an image with a single grayscale channel, which can save our memory. This converts our colorful image into a black and white image by preserving the data that is required for object detection. To find out if we need grayscale or not, we need to understand how our end application of your model works. And how much of a role does color play in our detection mechanism? If it is minimal, then grayscaling is a really good option. Then we will move on to the next step. That is auto-adjusting contrast. It enhances an image. With low contrast, we can apply different transformations. It is more useful in line detection applications. And moving on we have the tile transformation. As we know, detecting small objects is one of the most challenging and important problems in computer vision. If we want our model to detect small objects, we have to tile our images as a preprocessing step. If we have high resolution images, we can improve accuracy on small objects by dividing them into tiles using tile transformation tools like Tile Split. Since we are working with low resolution images, this will not be of much use to us. So we're moving on to the next preprocessing step, which is class modification. Here we can change the names of the classes. Sometimes the class name is the number, so we can give alternate names or change the class names to whatever we want, but we must ensure that the class represents what the model detects so that it is not confusing once the model starts detecting. We now come to the final preprocessing step, which is filtered null. We'll use the null filter because sometimes we will see a lot of images where we might have missed one or two annotations. After all, they don't meet the criteria. Normally we can delete that image, but now that we have a lot of images, it takes a long time to delete those. 
using the filter null will delete all these images that do not have annotations. The advantage here is that we can either keep a certain ratio of null images or fully remove them. Keeping it at 0% keeps all the null annotations, whereas making it 100% means removing all the empty annotations. The reason we might need to keep this is that sometimes we have a background and we want the model to intentionally detect it as a background. It is good, but sometimes having no annotations can cause problems for some models. So we will annotate the background as a new class named background, but it does not show up in the result images as a background. So that concludes all the preprocessing steps that Roboflow provides. Next, we have data augmentation. Data augmentation is the process by which we can increase a model's performance by creating more diversity in our learning examples. The key benefit of doing data augmentation is that it increases the model's reproducibility. For example, if our model is trained to do a particular task with a particular training data set, it might not do well if the data set is completely different. If we want to deploy a model on data that looks a lot different than our training data set, then data augmentation will help us detect even that kind of data and decrease training time. If we give the model a great variety of training data, the training time will decrease because of the model's efficient learning pattern. To apply the augmentation techniques, we will select Add Augmentation step. Here, you can see the different types of augmentations that we can apply. Mainly divided into two categories, image level augmentations and bounding box level augmentations. In the image level augmentation, the augmentation applies to the complete image, and in the bounding box augmentation, we change only the content within a given bounding box of the image. And as we are doing object detection, we will apply the bounding box level augmentation but for demonstration purposes, I'll show each process in the image level augmentation because a live preview is not available in the bounding box level augmentation section. The first augmentation technique with which we will experiment is the flip. The flip is nothing, but we either flip the image horizontally or vertically, and when the model is trying to train on it, it treats it as a different image than the original one. As we can add horizontal or vertical flips. Flipping an image is a deceptively simple method that significantly boosts model performance. The next step is a 90 degree rotation. Random rotation is a popular method of data augmentation. The position of an object in the frame is changed by randomly rotating a source image a certain number of degrees either clockwise, counterclockwise or upside down. Notably, for object detection issues, the bounding box must also be updated to include the resulting object. And if orientation is irrelevant, such as when your application processes images in portrait or landscape mode, then there is no need to apply the 90 degree rotation. Now, the next process is cropping. We create a random subset of the original image using the data augmentation technique known as a random crop, because the objects of interest we want our models to learn are not always fully visible in the image or not on the same scale in our training data. RoboFlow provides us with a slider that enables us to set the percentage of cropping so that we don't overcrop or undercrop images. Next, we have the rotation. Again RoboFlow gives us a slider to adjust our rotation angles for the rotation. To make your model more resistant to camera roll, give rotation some variation. And the next process is shear. Shear is nothing but RoboFlow stretches your data at a particular angle and tilts and changes the perspective so that the training model sees it as a completely different image with a different perspective and a different angle. Then we have the brightness, we can adjust the saturation of the color here. It is nothing but the intensity of the color. If we increase it, we can see in the bottom right picture that the intensity of each color increases, and at 0%, it's normal. And the same goes for darkness. To make your model more adaptable to changes in lighting and camera settings, I'll recommend adding some variation to the image brightness. The next technique is exposure. Exposure is pretty much self-explanatory. It increases or decreases the light that is there in the photo, and RoboFlow increases or decreases the exposure to make it look like a different image so that certain features might be hidden or certain features might show better that way, and to help your model be more resistant to changes in lighting and camera settings.
The next augmentation technique is the blurring effect, which blurs the image to make sure that the model should be able to detect images even if the test image is blurred. So if all the training data is very clear but the test image is blurred, it might not do well. The blur helps us overcome that problem. The next technique is random noise. Random noise is nothing but random noise like grains and fading being added to the image to make it seem of lower quality so that the model can also detect objects in high quality images. In most instances, noise is best suited for augmentation. We seek to increase the variability of some images for the purposes of training to avoid overfitting, but we don't seek to induce noise into our validation and testing sets as well. Now I'll apply some augmentation techniques in bounding box level augmentation that is suited for our data, you can apply them according to your needs. Now that we have completed the pre-processing steps, we will download our dataset. To download the dataset, we will click on Generate. Then click Export. And select a format to download. As we are downloading the dataset to train YOLO v7, we will select YOLO v7 PyTorch. Then select Download Zip to Computer, and click Continue. It will take a few minutes to download as we have a few images, so it will download quickly. Once downloaded, we will upload it to Google Drive. As we have uploaded our dataset to Google Drive, so that's all for today's video. In the next video, we will learn how to train YOLO v7 on a custom image dataset. Thanks for watching until the end. We'll see you in the next video.